life it is a journey now my sermon for today it it will ask the question where are you going in life where are you going on this journey I again hope that you are joining me on the path to glory we are on a narrow path yes we are and on this narrow path we should be running the race of faith. And we know again that on the path that we are taking, we know that this path is filled with many hurdles, many obstacles for us. And that's what we take a look at here in my message for today. That there are again, many trials and many tribulations. This race, it is not one that is easily ran. Yet again, while we face those trials and tribulations, the writer within the scripture said that we ought not be discouraged on this journey. So my sermon today, it asks us, how do we handle being discouraged? That brings me to my key verse there, where my key verse for today's message is the third verse. We must take a look at how to handle running this race of faith. I'm in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. My key verse for today is the third verse. And there in the third verse, we see that the writer said to us today, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest while you run this race of faith, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Again, there in my key verse for today, there in the third verse, the writer said that while we run this race of faith, the writer said, consider him, that is, consider Christ, who endured such hostility from sinners. Amen. Now, from that verse, I want to focus on, and I want to talk to you all today for a thought. Don't be discouraged. Don't you give up. Again, we are on the path to glory, aren't we? And again, my thought for all of you today is don't you be discouraged. Don't you give up on this pathway. Amen. So on this, this path that we are on, we said that we're on the narrow path, right? We said that we're on the narrow path to glory. We've been saying that for the past month and a half now. How often do you consider Christ while you are on this journey? As you run the race of faith, how often do you consider Christ as you run this pathway, how often do you look to the example that Christ set for us? Scripture, it leaves us with words of encouragement when it comes to running this race of faith. And the writer here tells us that we ought to consider Christ. Well, we run this race of faith. Over in the ninth chapter of first Corinthians and the 24th and the 25th verse, Paul, he had words of encouragement for us as well, because he also talked about a race. Paul, he encouraged believers to run the race to obtain a prize. In other words, Paul, he said to us that we ought not run just to run. We ought not race just to race. Paul said that if you are running the race of faith, you ought to be running the race to win the race. How many of us desire to win the race today? See, Paul, he said that you ought to run to win the race because there is a prize. There is a trophy, if you will. There is a medal, if you will, at the end of this race. 
How many of us want that prize that's at the end of the race? Now, now some of us, we, we may begin to wonder, well, what's the prize at the end of the race? Well, Paul, he said for us in that scripture that the prize at the end of the race is an imperishable crown, a crown that will not perish, a crown that will not fade away. It is imperishable. Paul said, how many of us we want that crown today? I don't know about you, but I want that crown. I want to put that crown on my head. So I'm going to run this race. I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to run this race to win the race. Do you want to win the race with me today? So in order for us to win the race, Paul, he said that we should run the race we, we should run it disciplined. We must be temperate in this race, Paul said. We must be disciplined as we, we run this race. And I tell you today that the writer here in the epistle to the Hebrews shared that same thought with us. Where again, there in the first verse, the writer points a few things out for us. The writer tells us a few things that, that we need to do in order to run this race of faith. So, so I want to first point out some things here there in the first verse that the writer points out to us. I want to point it out to you today so that we can see how we should go about running the race of, of faith. Now, the first thing that the writer says for us to do there in that first verse is that we should again run this race with endurance. See, one of the biggest problems that, that many of us have today is that we think that this, this race, we think that it is a sprint. And so we, we, we try to run as fast as we can to, rent, to win the race. Because in our minds, if you're not first, you're last. So we, we have to beat everybody in order to, to win this race. However, with the writer saying here that we must run this race with endurance, the writer is telling us that this race is not a sprint. The writer is telling us that this race is a marathon. A marathon, that, that's one that takes a while, doesn't it? It ain't one that's over with in just a, a few seconds or just in a few minutes. You know, if you watch a marathon, you're going to be watching the race for a very long time. And so the writer here of this epistle said that it requires discipline in order for us to run the marathon. And any marathoner, anyone who runs a marathon, they will tell you that discipline is required to run the marathon. They will tell you that you must run that race with patience. See, they will tell you that, that you don't want to waste all of your energy right there at the start. You don't want to waste your energy. You don't want to waste up your gas while you run the marathon. Again, one of the biggest problems that many of us have today is that we waste up all of our energy while we run the marathon. And, and the real shame is that we waste up our energy on things that will do nothing for us. We waste up our energy on things that won't even help us get to the finish line. I tell you again today that it takes discipline. It takes patience if you are running the race of, of faith. You must take on the mindset that you're running a, a grueling marathon and not a sprint. You must be ready to therefore the end run on flatland. But while you are running on flatland, you must be prepared for the hills that come along the way. 
you know, I think of uh, the Peachtree Road race right now and how those guys at the Peachtree Road race, many of them, they start out sprinting at the start. And by the time they make it to Heartbreak Hill, many of them are walking up the hill, can barely get up the hill. We don't want to find ourselves in that position because something that we know for a certain on our journey is that while we may run on flat ground at time, we know that there are going to be hills that come along the way. In other words, as we saw in my sermon last week, we know that we are going to have trials. We know that we're going to have tribulations. And in fact, we know that our trials and our tribulations, we know that they are going to be many. Will you be able to make it through your trials? Will you be able to make it through your tribulations? How are you running this race of faith today? Are you running the race of faith today? I ask you. And if you are running the race of faith, I ask you today, are you a disciplined runner? I ask you today, are you running to win this race? And again, I hope that you are. So we'll see there again in the first verse that the writer encouraged those believers who may not be running the race. The writer encouraged them to get up and to get moving. It's good for us to, yes, know the word of God, but as I said last week, the word of God, it demands us to take action. The word of God, it demands us to get up and to get moving. And so to start running the race of faith, we'll see there in the first verse that the writer said that you ought to lay aside every weight and the sin which ensnares. In other words, if you are going to run this race, you ought not be trying to run the race while carrying a heavy weight, while, while carrying a heavy load. It would be foolish of you to try and run a marathon and you carry 500 pounds on your back. Tell me, do you think that you can finish that race while, while carrying around a whole bunch of weight? Do you think that you can actually win the race carrying around a whole bunch of weight? So Andrew back there shaking his head. Andrew started shaking his head as soon as I started asking the first question. So if we know that, why do so many of us carry around so much weight on our shoulders today? And we say that we're running the race of faith. Many of us, we carry around all of this guilt we carry around all of our burdens. We carry it all on our shoulders. And for what reason do we do it? Is it for our pride? Is it for our ego? What do you get out of carrying all around all, all of your weight, all of those burdens, all of those aches and those pains, all of the guilt from, from all the wrongdoing that you did? What do you get out of carrying it all on your shoulders? Rather than ditching our weight as we should, many of us, we just keep on walking around with it, keep on trying to run with it on our shoulders. And the only thing that does is weigh us down to where we get so weary on this journey, to where we get to the point that we are about to faint on this journey. We can't finish the race while carrying that weight. Peter, he encouraged over in the fifth chapter of first Peter and the seventh verse. We saw it last week in my message. Peter said that we ought to cast our cares upon the Lord for the Lord cares for us. If you run this race of faith today, you ought to be casting off your burdens onto the Lord. God does not want you to carry around that heavy weight on this journey. Now, Peter, he didn't come up with that on his own. Over in the 11th chapter of Matthew's gospel and the 28th verse, 
Jesus, he said, come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus himself said, if you are weighed down in your soul today, why aren't you coming to me and turning it over to me? Again, the writer said that we should consider Christ in my key verse. How many of us are doing that today on this journey? I'll tell you today that you aren't going to win this race if you aren't casting your cares upon the Lord. You aren't going to complete, you aren't going to finish this race if you aren't turning it all over to Jesus. Again, my desire is to finish this race. My desire for you is for you to finish this race as well. Cast your cares upon the Lord. You see, unlike other races where only one can win the race, in this race, the race of faith, everyone who enters into the race can win it. Do you believe that you can win the race today? If you believe that you can win the race today, say that you believe it today. Say that you believe that you can win that race. Say it not out loud. Say it in your heart today. Confess it. Now there in the second verse, we'll see that the writer, the writer continued to speak about running the race of faith. The writer there called on runners to again, look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Why is it that we should look unto Jesus? Well, Jesus, he set the example for how this race should be run. See, Jesus, he has ran this race. Not only has Jesus ran this race, but he completed this race. Jesus, he has already won the race and he sets the example for how we can go about winning this race as well. Now, how is it that, that Jesus, how is it that he won the race? Jesus, the writer said, endure the cross, despising the shame. And as we know, Jesus, he suffered while he ran this race. Jesus, he didn't have it easy as he ran the race of faith. Peter wrote, for Christ also suffered once for sins for just, for the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That is why he ran the race. Yet as the writer of this epistle said here to us today, Jesus, he ran the race for the joy that was set before him. I ask you today, why do you run this race? Why is it that you decided to enter into the marathon? You see, again, many of us, we'd much rather run a sprint because that race ain't all that long. But many of us, we have decided to, to enter into a grueling marathon. Why so? Why did you enter into the race? Why do you run the race of faith? And I don't know about you, but I run this race for the prize. And so again, we should run this race for the joy that is set before us, that prize that is set for us, that imperishable crown that is set before us. We should run with hope of receiving that crown. We should run for the joy of wearing that crown on our head. Again, I ask today, do you want that crown? You see, many run this race like, like how I sometimes feel when it's my workout day, when it's my day to get on the bike. I don't want to get on the bike, but I get on it. Many of us, we say that we run the race of faith today, but we go through the motions of running this race. We're just running the run. That is not how the Lord wants you to run the race of faith. That is not how God wants you to travel down the narrow path. 
The Lord said that you should go through life with joy in your heart. You should love to be on this pathway. You should love to run the race of faith and you should run it with hope in your heart today. We shouldn't be running with a heart where we are defeated. We shouldn't be running with a heart where we are simply going through the motions today. No, we should run with a heart of hope while we run this race. We should again, love to be in this race. We should, we should run with the desire to make it to the finish line. Again, there is a prize that is before us. Jesus, he said in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they should be, for they shall be filled. Jesus, he said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, he said, blessed are you when they revile, when they hate, when they persecute you for my sake. Jesus, he said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Again, I don't know about you, but I run this race for the reward that waits for me in heaven. That is why I run this race. Why should I run this race any other kind of way? Why should I run this race just going through the motions with so great a prize it awaits me in the kingdom of heaven? I should run like I look forward to getting to heaven one day. That's how I should run. And I shouldn't let anything weigh me down from getting to heaven. I shouldn't let anything hinder me from getting to heaven. I ought not be discouraged as I run this race. So I will run this race with discipline. I will run this race with hope and I will run this race with joy so that I may obtain the prize. Will you do the same? Will you run this race with hope and will you run this race with joy? Now, some believers, they often wonder, as they run this race, well, why do I have to go through trials and tribulation? Some believers, they often wonder, well, why do I have to run up hills? Why can't it always just be flat ground while I run the race of faith? Some of us, we wonder, why do I have to suffer? Have you ever wondered that before? Why does God allow me? I'm his child. Why does God, why does he allow me to suffer? Why do I have to suffer? A lot of us, we, we, we think to ourselves that since we are God's children, we ought not have to ever suffer in life. Yet we suffer. Why do we suffer? We often wonder. David, he said that many are the afflictions of the righteous. Why are our afflictions, why are they so many? Why is it that we suffer in life? I want to answer that question today. Because again, this race is not an easy one for us to be on. So we must understand why is it not so easy for us? We must understand why is it that we suffer on this journey? First off, again, let us look unto Jesus. Let us remember Jesus. Let us remember that Jesus, he repeatedly said to his disciples, a servant is not greater than his master. Let us once again consider that we are God's children. Let us once again remember that we are following Jesus. And again, Jesus himself, he suffered. So if Jesus suffered, you better believe that we too are going to suffer. So why is that? 
Why is it that we suffer on this journey? I have found that our sufferings, they often begin sadly with poor decisions that we make in life. Uh Oh, it would be great if we were perfect. It would be great if we always made the right decisions. It would be great if we never messed up. It would be great if we never failed, but we are fallible creatures, aren't we? (coughs) We are fallible creatures and it is inevitable that we are going to have our missteps. It is inevitable that we are going to make poor decisions. It is inevitable that you are going to make the wrong decisions. We can't help that. And so those poor decisions, they come with consequences, which means that we may hurt for a moment because of the decision that we made. Trust me, I know a thing or two about making poor decisions in my own life that came back to haunt me. Every now and then I referenced, and I did it this morning, where I referenced my kidney failure. How how I had to go through five years of dialysis. And during that time, I would often consider, I would often think to myself how I could have taken measures that would have prevented me from ever having to go through dialysis from, from my kidneys failing me. I could have not ignored my mom and my dad about not going to the doctor. I could have did a better job of keeping up with my blood pressure. But you know, I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was doing what was best, but that came back and that got me in the end. Many of us, again, we make decisions in our life with that mindset that we know what is best for us. And so we move foolishly, ignoring wise counsel, ignoring wise advice, only for it to come back around and for it to get us. And we end up falling down and we suffer. We suffer from our mistakes. And so many of us, we begin to get discouraged over over the, the errors that we have made. And we begin to wonder, well, why God has not pulled us out of our sufferings just yet. I say to you today, don't be discouraged by your missteps. Don't be discouraged when you fall down. You see today you may suffer from your errors, but you can still learn through your errors. You can still grow from the mistakes that you make in life the 24th chapter of Proverbs and the 16th verse, it tells us that one who is righteous may fall seven times, but will rise again. Do you believe that today? So I say to you today that you may suffer from falling down, but you will get back up. God will raise you back up. He will raise you back up when you have learned from your errors. You may fall down today, but you're falling down today. It will help you be able to run this race in a better way. You have learned from your mistakes. That's one reason why you suffer today. Another cause for why we suffer is due to sin and temptation. Those who choose not to follow Christ, those who choose to be ignorant of disobeying God, they don't really suffer from sin and temptation in the same way that we do. We who have confessed faith in our heart. You see, we know that Without trust, we know that without obedience, we know that it is impossible for us to please the Lord. But we desire to please the Lord today, don't we? 
And so because we desire to please the Lord today, we do our very best to live in a manner of obedience. We do our very best to, to follow his instructions. We do our very best, as we saw in my sermon last week, to listen and to do. Yet, as Paul said over in the seventh chapter of Romans and the 15th verse, Paul said that he desired to, to do the will of the Lord. He said, what I will to do that I do not practice. See, Paul, he spoke of a war that was taking place within himself, a war that takes place within all of us as God's children today. Paul, he said that there was a war between the law of God that dwelt in him and then the law of sin that also dwelled in him the law of his flesh, that it dwells in all of God's children today. The word of God abides in us. His law abides in us, but our old man is still present within us as well. In those two contrary parts, they are always butting hairs. The part of us that does not want to disobey the Lord. And then that part of us that say, oh man, it's okay. God will overlook it. God don't care. God, he'll forgive you. You okay? Go ahead. Go ahead and, and do that one thing. You all right. In that war that takes place within us between what we know is right and what we know is wrong, it causes us to suffer much. Our sin, when we do give in to old man, it grieves us in our soul. We say, Lord, I have messed up. I have messed up. I have messed up. And many of us, when we mess up, we don't even want to turn to God. And that causes us to suffer in, in our soul. But again, we must remember to make our confessions known to the Lord today. God, he is both faithful and just to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. That's what John said in first John in the first chapter in the ninth verse. And so one thing that we learn in that error, the one thing that we learned there is that again, God, he is faithful and just. We learn that the Lord is more pleased with our effort of faith rather than our being stagnant in faith. We learn that we must move by faith, even though we aren't perfect. Now, another reason why many of us suffer on this journey today is because we choose to move in our faith. There in the third verse, the writer pointed to, again, how Jesus endured hostility from sinners against him. I consider there from my key verse, I consider why it was that Jesus was despised in this world. I consider why it was that Jesus suffered in this world. Why it was that Jesus was persecuted in this world? What was it that Jesus did? Well, he healed the lame, right? He caused the blind to be able to see. He healed those who were sick. And then he taught that we should love the Lord with our whole heart and we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That is all that Jesus did. And, and for doing that, for doing the good work of the Lord, he was demonized. The people said that he had a demon. He was despised. Jesus was hated for sharing a message of love. 
How could someone be despised for sharing a message of loving others? How could someone be despised for doing good, for wanting others to be uplifted? How could somebody be hated for that? And Jesus, he was despised because he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He was despised because he chose to, to sit down with sinners. Jesus, he was despised because he chose to help the sinners. See, Jesus, he moved against a certain narrative. Jesus, he moved against the narrative of what the Messiah was supposed to be to the Jews. And so for that, he was hated by the Jews, by the religious leaders. You see, when one moves in sincere faith, they move against the world. When one moves in sincere faith, they are moving in in something that the world hates. They are moving in something that the world despises. You see, when you move in sincere faith today, as you should, you're moving in the divine truth. You're moving in the word of God. The truth that you move in, it can be off-putting to many. To be clear, the truth that, again, I am talking about today, it is of the Lord. It should not be confused with the truth of a man. It should not be confused with the truth of a woman. It should not be confused with the conspiracies of a madman. I hope you hear me here today. It is the divine truth that all of us who run the race of faith, it is the divine truth by which we should be running by today. So there are times on this journey where you as God's child will move against the narrative of what a Christian is thought to be. I don't know if you hear me here today. You see, Jesus, he reached out to sinners. Guess what? You as a child of God, you should be doing the same. You should be reaching out to sinners today. Some Christians, they will turn their nose up at you if you sit down with a sinner. The religious leaders, they did it to Jesus, so why wouldn't they do it to you? They persecuted Jesus for doing that, so why wouldn't they do it to you? There may be times as you run this race of faith where you may even feel like you're on an island all alone. But again, I say to you today, don't you be discouraged for being or feeling like you are on an island all alone because you're choosing to move by faith in the Lord. Those with a worldly view, they may despise your views. They may laugh at you just as they laughed at Jesus. Again, I tell you today, don't you be discouraged if they laugh at you for your faith. You better believe that if they laugh, that the devil is laughing at you too. And if you fall down, you better believe that the devil is going to laugh when you fall down. But don't you be discouraged when they laugh at you and when he laughs at you. You see, the way the world turns all around us, again, that may cause some of us to be discouraged today, but again, don't you be discouraged. I say to you today, you are in this world for a reason. You are in this world for a purpose. And you should move according to that purpose. You should run this race. You see, another reason why we suffer today is for the glory of God. 
See, when Lazarus, when he got sick and when he died, we're told over in the 11th chapter of John's gospel and the fourth verse that Jesus said of Lazarus's death that his sickness, it was not unto death, but for the glory of God. Now, some will consider that the Lord uses us as his guinea pigs, but that could not be any further from the truth. God, he does not permit you to suffer for no reason at all. As I said earlier today, it is inevitable in life that we are going to have trials and tribulations. We are going to have our heartaches. We are going to have our pain. However, by faith, I tell you today that we are able to glorify the Lord in our suffering in our trials and in our tribulations and all that you go through in life, you can glorify the Lord and you will glorify the Lord. See in his letter, James, he said that we should rejoice in our sufferings. The reason why James said that is because in the testing of our faith, our patience, it increases. That one thing that we need, the one thing that we require to make it on this journey, it increases in our suffering. Our patience, it increases. Yes, we are going to go through some things in life, but don't you be discouraged. You are a testimony of the Lord. You are a testimony of his grace. You are a testimony of his authority as well. Whether in life or in death, even we are able to glorify the Lord. We are able to let somebody know somewhere just how good God is because we will have made it on this journey. Let us remember that we are here to carry out God's will and God's will is for everyone to have everlasting life in his kingdom. If they believe in him, we can be that testimony today. If we choose to continue to run the race of faith, we can be that testimony to somebody somewhere so that they can see the example of running this race so that they can get out of the stands so that they can get out of the seats so that they can get up and run the race of faith as well. With our suffering in mind, I want you to again, take a note there of my key verse there. I want you to take note of the word endured in the past tense there. Him who endured hostility. See in the past tense, the word endured means that one was able to tolerate that one was able to overcome what it was that they were going through. So for for the writer to say that him, Jesus there endured such hostility. The writer was saying there that Jesus, he tolerated the hostility. The writer was saying, is saying there that, that Jesus, that he overcame great hostility as he was on the journey. All that he went through, all that he suffered through, the writer is saying there that Jesus, he overcame it. If we look unto Jesus, if we consider him at the end of our story, when we have reached the finish line, there will be one who will say of us that they endured their sufferings. They endured the race. They finished the race. They won the race. They overcame all that they went through in life. 
I don't know if there's anything better that someone can say about us when we have reached that finish line. That they endured. I don't know about y'all today, but again, I want to say, I want someone to say about me that Pastor McCrary, he endured. That's what I won't say about me one day. Now, as it is said there in the 11th verse, it is said there that no chastening for the present seems joyful, but painful. Chastening meaning punishment, chastening meaning suffering. I don't know how many of us we suffer today and say, man, this is a good time. I don't know how many of us are going through it and say, man, this is a good time. Any of us, when we go through it, we say, man, I'm catching hell today. That's what we say. Yet as God's children, we have been warned that we will have trials, that we will have tribulation. We have been warned so that we can be prepared for what is ahead of us. So that when those hills, when we come upon that hill that is ahead of us, so that we aren't necessarily afraid of that hill. We aren't warned about that hill so that we can just say, man, I'm not going to go up that hill. No, we are warned of that hill so that we can have that energy saved up to be able to storm up that hill. We know that when we look at that hill, we know that our help it is coming not from man. We know that we don't have to rely on our own selves to make it up that hill. We know that when we look to that hill, we know that our help, we know that it comes from the Lord. Yes, this race, it is going to be difficult. Yes, this race, it is going to be painful at times, but the Lord, he has given us hope that we can make it through all that we go through on this journey. We have the ability to finish this race. All we have to do is have the faith. Do you have that faith today? The writer said there in that 11 verse said afterwards, Afterwards, it, our suffering, yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This is a verse that reminds me of the 30th Psalm and the fourth verse. That old familiar saying that many of us, we know it very well. Weeping, it may endure for a night, but what is it that comes in the morning? We know that saying very well. We may again suffer today, but we know what awaits us, don't we? Don't be discouraged. Don't you give up. You may suffer. You may suffer from, from those poor decisions. You may suffer from sin and temptation and sin and temptation. It may get the best of you at times. You may suffer because you choose to stand on faith. You choose to stand in the love of God. You choose to stand for what is right and, and what is just. And, and somebody somewhere, they may not like you. They may despise you. They may even persecute you. And they may cause suffering for you. You may even suffer from your aches and from your pains, from, from your afflictions, from your sickness, from your disabilities. That may be even a cause of suffering, but don't you be discouraged today. Don't you give up today. Because again, the Lord, he is with you. And again, I want you to know today that God, he is faithful to what he asks promise to you. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning because God will deliver you to that joy. 
So the writer there in that 12th verse, the writer encouraged us to strengthen the hands that hang down and to strengthen our feeble knees. It's time for us to pump. We need to finish this race and we need to finish it strongly. The writer said that we should make straight paths for our feet so that we don't stumble off course, so that we don't injure ourselves. Don't you get tired in this race? Consider the Lord, consider Christ, and start pumping those hands, start pumping those knees higher. Run with strength, run with power. Let us remember that Jesus said we will have trials. We will have tribulations, but we should be of good cheer because he overcame the world. Let us remember that as we run this race, let us not give in to our sufferings. But today I say to you that if you will pray this prayer, to be uplifted, if you pray the prayer to be encouraged, if you pray the prayer to be motivated in your soul, you will finish this race. You will overcome all that you go through in life. You will overcome your trials, you will overcome your tribulations, and you will reach the heavenly gates. And God, he will say to you, well done. You have finished the race and he will welcome you into his kingdom. Will you run this race today? And will you run it with faith? I hope that you will. Amen. 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 Hey there. Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's sermon. I hope again that you took something out of this week's sermon that you can apply it to yourself and that you can walk in it, that you can live by faith. Make sure that you share this week's message. Make sure you're sharing it with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you'll come back for next week's sermon. Make sure that you're following the channel so that you don't miss the next notification for next week's sermon so that you don't miss a notification for the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies, or the food for thoughts as well. Make sure that you're following the channel today.